Rich McKay Reed asks, what's normally required or best practice for winter flying with snow on the ground and freezing temps? Um, so one concern is waterproofing. You're going to want a conformal coat the quad thoroughly. You want to be aware that there are things you can't get conformal coating on or it will ruin them. Um, your USB port, any plug needs to have something plugged into it so the conformal doesn't get on it. Your barometer, if you have a barometer, needs to be taped over and, and more. I'm not going to go over the complete list right here. Um, there's videos out there about conformal coating. You could also use something like the Flywoo spray. Now this stuff is interesting. The Flywoo hydrophobic spray. Um, this stuff keeps water off your drone, but you can just spray it anywhere and it doesn't break anything. Well, that sounds pretty good. What's the trade-off? There's always a trade-off. The trade-off is that you're expected to apply it every time you fly. So the reason you can spray this stuff on connectors and it doesn't ruin the connectors is it's, it's very easy to just scrape off. So when you plug the connector in, it just basically scrapes it off. But that also means that while you're flying and crashing and landing and handling your drone, it's getting scraped off. So the idea here is you buy this bottle and you just spritz it all over your, your electronics and then they're, they're protected, theoretically. Um, it's, it's like clearly not going to be as good a protection as conformal coating, but it's going to be a lot easier to live with. Um, and then the other thing is your batteries, you can need to keep them warm. If your batteries get cold, the uh, performance is going to be terrible. So keep your batteries in a warm car. You can get heated battery bags. Some people use little hand warmers to keep the batteries warm. Some people put them in their pockets or inside their jacket, let their body heat keep them warm. But if the batteries are freezing cold, not only will the battery perform badly, but it'll also potentially be damaged when you try to use it. So those are some things to think about. What can an F7 or an H7 do that an F4 cannot? Um, F7 and H7 are faster processors than F4. They also have more program memory, so they can hold more code, larger code, and they run faster, so they can do more complicated things. The H7 has additional processing on board. The H7 can actually do video and audio processing as part of the chip. So, for example, on an H7, it's, you don't need a separate OSD chip. The H7 itself can draw the OSD on an analog camera. An H7, uh, Dominic Clifton, uh, on his SP Racing flight controller, came up with a uh, technology where the PID loop error is output as an analog audio signal to the video feed, to your earpiece, over the video transmitter. No shit. I don't, it, and so basically, as you're flying, you're hearing in your earpiece a sound that indicates the quality of the PID loop, and you can use it for PID tuning. That's d made possible because the H7 can process analog signals natively. That's pretty cool. Um, in general, though, F7 and H7 are faster and have more program memory. The other difference is that the F7 and the H7 have invertible UARTs. So there are some serial protocols like SBUS that use an inverted serial signal, and an F4 cannot process those signals without a hardware inverter. It's just a, literally a little circuit, a little, a little component that's on the, on the board. And that means with an F4, if you're trying to use an inverted serial signal like SBUS, you can only use it on one UART because that's the UART the manufacturer put the inverter on and that UART's no good for anything else. So with an F7 and an H7, you have more flexibility with where you solder your peripherals and use the UARTs. Generally, the F7 and the H7 will have more usable UARTs, although that's not always true. Some of the F4 have uh, plenty of UARTs. Dexter Taylor, thank you for a $5 super chat. I've been using the DJI FPV for a bit, looking to get my first quadcopter. Want to reuse the goggles and the remote. Any recommendations? Um, if you have the DJI FPV, excuse me, apologize for that. Um, if, you want to, if you have the DJI FPV, then you probably have the V2 goggles and the V1 remote. Right, Blunty? Or did the FPV drone come with a V2 remote? Oh, God, I don't remember. It's the V2 remote, right? It's the RC2. I'm pretty it sure. It would be the that. RC2. Yeah. So you have the RC2 and the V2 goggles. I believe that means that you can use 
the Runcam Link or Caddx Vista video transmitter and any of their associated cameras. You cannot use the O3 because it won't be compatible with the RC2, but it will be. The O3 would be compatible with the goggles, but I think not the RC2. No, 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 no. Oh, God. The Runcam Link and Caddx Vista will only be compatible with the V1 remote, not the not the RC2. If you're using goggles V2. He, which I assume he is because he bought the DJI FPV. Yeah. The DJI FPV drone came with the V2 goggles. If he gets an O3, can he use the V2 goggles and the RC2? Damn. Yes. Yeah. He can. Okay, so what you need to do is you need to get a drone with a DJI O3 air unit. You need to update your goggles and your remote to the latest firmware, and then you can use them with the O3, and you'll be good to go. And there are many, many bind and flies that you could buy. Take a look at the Gep RC Mark V. Take a look at the Flywoo Flylens 85 if you want something smaller. There are many available with the O3 air unit. Flying FPV says I have a range issue with my VTX. My video is super clean when I'm close, but 10 feet away, it's choppy and black lines everywhere. My guess is that you're in pit mode. Even at 25 milliwatts, the minimum power for most flight, most uh, VTXs, you should get more than 10 feet away. If your video drops out after 10 feet, your VTX is likely in pit mode. What you need to do is look up your VTX's manual at how to take it out of pit mode. And the exact way to do that is going to vary depending on, depending on your VTX. But it's probably in pit mode, and that's uh, how, you, how you need to fix it. Other possibilities are you're on the wrong channel. You used auto scan and you're close, but you're not on the actual right channel, right? Uh, it could be that you need to unlock the VTX. You've set the power, but it's not actually getting to that power because some VTX need to be unlocked. You can check the manual for that procedure. And it could be that you have a damaged antenna or something like that, of course. And it could be, did you say the bad VTX table? Nope. That's, a good, oh. that's another one. It could be that your VTX table has the wrong power levels, and... Um... Uh, that will cause the VTX to lock itself at 25 milliwatts. But that would be 25 milliwatts, not pit mode. Do any of them go to pit mode in that situation? I don't think so. I think so. it goes to the lowest available power on the table, which I think in some cases can be pit, but normally it's 25 and then pit's two, right? Like cause sometimes you I don't get the zero on two. Okay. I don't know about that. All right. Yeah, but it could. that could be it. It could be bad VTX table. I just had to get the last word in. <laughs>